But if it's not Marge, then who is it? Where do I begin looking? This really goes beyond my training as a furniture salesman, so <laughs> now if you don't want the sofa, I'll have to ask you to leave. <laughs> hey, Bernie, soulmate! <laughs> so stupid. The Simpsons in all its years on telly has covered some amazing mental health topics. Addiction, ADHD, grief. But this one, to me, parallels today's resurgence in psychedelic medicine. Hi, I'm Dr. Elliot, I'm a psychiatrist, and I make content all about mental health, and I'm reacting to the episode called The Mysterious Voyage of Homer. Homer, the man with the iron stomach, apparently eats chilli so hot that he trips. And while psychedelic retreats in 2025 are much more likely to be done with ayahuasca, the parallels are actually quite striking. Ready? Let's crack on. Hey, who cut something out of my paper? 50 ways not to me. waste your not weekend. Not me, I'm more of a male tamperer. Well, don't look at me. Just because I'm holding a pair of scissors. Scissors which I need to, uh, to gussy up these curtains. Makes sense. <laughs> Marge isn't a convincing liar, is she? I would haphazard a hypothesis that being a bad liar is associated with being a strong empath, where the emotional and physiological response to doing something that you know is morally wrong is just too palpable to actually mask. What's that smell? Onions? Chili powder? Cumin? Juicy ground chuck! It's chili! Oh my god, I'm missing the chili cook-off! I'm missing the cook-off! It's going on right now! Smells evoke strong emotions and can actually bring back very intense memories. Hopefully, happy and joyous ones, but not necessarily so. The olfactory system which detects smell has anatomical links with numerous structures in the brain, including the amygdala, which houses a lot of our intense emotional responses, the hippocampus for short-term memory, the striatum for reward, and the brainstem, where both our fight and flight and rest and digest responses can emanate from. Oh, well, of course, everything looks bad if you remember it. <laughs> now, where are my chili boots? <laughs> ah. Okay, we'll go to the chili cook off. <laughs> Everything's bad if you remember it. I love that line. Our memories are unfortunately very, very unreliable. We get prone to emotional bias. We're more likely to remember aspects of an event that resonate with our emotions. When we're feeling happy, we're more likely to remember happy memories or happy moments of particular memories and maybe put more weight on those things. Same goes for sad memories or anxious ones or fearful ones. That can lead us to then putting more weight on the importance of certain aspects of past events based on the emotions at the time and recontextualizing memories of past trauma is the basis of important trauma-focused therapies like EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. Promise me you won't have any beer. Okay, quit nagging me, I won't have any beer. Jeez, why don't you have a cigarette or something? Hmm, I suppose I could. Nicotine in cigarettes is a stimulant, but that initial stimulating response and euphoria can also be very relaxing. The notion of that almost seems paradoxical, but exactly the same thing happens when you have a cup of tea. Decent bit of caffeine in this. That's a stimulant. Howdy, howdy, Marge and Homer. Oh, my mistake. Homer's not even with you. Probably just knocking back a few refreshments. <laughs> Thank you for your concern, Helen. Oh, the irony slash hypocrisy of the priest's wife taking her job as the supposed voice of morality as a license to gossip. Be curious, not judgmental. That's obviously a Ted Lasso quote, not my own. Now, Helen, let us not glory in Homer's binge drinking. There but for the grace of God goes Marge herself. So let's wait till Marge goes and then gossip more. The formal definition of binge drinking slightly varies depending on what resource you use. The WHO, so the World Health Organization, defines binge drinking more generally as heavy episodic drinking, which is 60 grams or more of pure alcohol. That's equivalent to about six standard drinks, and that's at least on one occasion in the past 30 days. The CDC defines it as drinking five or more standard drinks on one occasion. By those definitions, the Brits, absolutely fantastic at binge drinking. It's not a compliment. You reckon a square could get a dance? Do you know how? Ma'am, I wouldn't honk the honk if I couldn't tonk the tonk. <laughs> I'm bringing back memories of me as a kid watching this, not fully getting it, and now me in my mid-30s as an out gay man, just like... <laughs> Your perception of Mr. Smithers completely changes. Do you remember the Whippet scene? Oh, and all the dolls in his house. It's Pete Camp, and we know he likes a daddy. The merciless peppers of Quetzalcoatlango. <gasps> deep in the jungle primeval by the inmates of a Guatemalan insane asylum. 
believe it or not, I am not aware of any specific examples of super hot chilies being grown by patients in any insane asylum at any point in history. But types of gardening therapy are something that is commonly done for long-term patients in psychiatric hospitals, and I see no reasons why chilies couldn't be grown as part of that. Well, maybe in some settings, in the wrong hands, I suppose a chili could be a weapon? With hindsight, just thinking it through, maybe it wouldn't get past the risk assessment. <laughs> Did that say proof of age or exact change required? <laughs> There's always something new you discover in this show. Little hidden gems, it's brilliant. The active ingredient in chili peppers that gives it the hotness is called capsaicin. It's naturally occurring in any members of the plant family capsicum. Actually, strictly, it's the genus capsicum, not the family capsicum. Any biologist watching this before you kind of tear me to shreds for that. But that includes bell peppers, jalapenos, habaneros. In your body, capsaicin binds to a receptor called the TRVP1 receptor, the transient receptor potential vanilloid 1. Rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> but these receptors are on our skin, they're in our mouth. They're responsible for sensing both heat and pain and can interpret these stimuli in the same way. That's why we get a burning sensation that is both heat and pain, to some degree. So he's now just put a layer of Good Lord, this can't be wax on to cover these receptors. Logic, steam should be shooting out of his ears. His ears if we're lucky. Capsaicin has fascinating effects on the brain because it stimulates the pain receptors even in the absence of a painful stimulus. That triggers a release of dopamine and endorphins, which might account for why some people going on hot ones is exciting rather than being utterly terrifying. So these are distortions of real things around him. So these would be classified as illusions misinterpretations or distortions of things that really are in your environment. Specifically, this is called metamorphopsia, where these visual distortions are usually uh, warped, misshapen, or differently sized versions of things that are really there. Off of real life, the most common cause for that are migraines and some eye conditions. Doesn't tend to happen as a result of intoxication or mental illness. What with Marge, eight Guatemalan insanity peppers, then I... Oh. Okay, so this is a bit more than an illusion now, right? Where am I, Shelbyville? <laughs> so this is like an LSD trip. LSD, or lysergic acid diethyl amide. Try saying that five times fast. Lysergic acid diethyl amide. Lysergic acid diethyl amide. Lysergic acid diethyl amide. Oh, three times a day. <laughs> but it exerts its effects primarily by binding to a receptor in our brain called the 5-HT2A receptor. It's a type of serotonin receptor. It leads to very characteristic changes in perception, mood, cognition. But it also suppresses a network of structures called the default mode network. That's normally to do with your sense of self introspection. And it's this effect that accounts for a phenomenon that researchers call ego dissolution, a sense of losing the boundary between yourself and the external world. Come on, Marge. Would you fight fair? I never do this to you. Talk to me! It's a bit like those depictions of people getting illusions in the desert, which is an interplay of environmental conditions, heats, lights, monotony, sensory limitations, psychological stress, physiological stress. We talked about LSD, but there's a host of other psychedelics that have been used for research reasons back in the 50s and are again today that people, you know, also take for non-medical reasons as well. You shouldn't. But mescaline from the peyote cactus, psilocybin or magic mushrooms, DMT or dimethyltryptamine, and even MDMA or ecstasy has some psychedelic properties as well as some stimulant ones. That's before we get onto the sort of newer synthetic forms that are actually causing a huge host of problems in different corners of society. 2CB, for example. Make sense? Remember the baby in Teletubbies in the sun? Fear not, home. What it made me think of. I am your spirit guide. Oh, yeah. There is a lesson you must learn. If it's about laying off the insanity peppers, I'm way ahead of you. No, I speak of a deeper wisdom. I was just to think, where are that baby's parents? They're worse than the mother in Home Alone. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapies started in the 50s and were still going on in the 1960s. So what's happening today in research, it's not new. And back in those days, it was used experimentally as a treatment for certain mental illnesses, much like it's being experimented with today. But it was also used for some less than ethical purposes, gay conversion therapy, and then weaponized by the CIA in projects like Project MKUltra and Project Artichoke. Fast forward to today and its role is being reinvestigated as 
a potential treatment for conditions like depression, addiction, anxiety disorders, even some eating disorders. And in parallel to that, the sort of commercialization of ayahuasca retreats has turned into this big tourism industry that has zero regulation. It's actually really quite dangerous. Ayahuasca is a combination of DMT, so dimethyltryptamine, and a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that stops that DMT from being quickly broken down, allowing it to persist to have a much more prolonged psychedelic effect. The problem, Homer, is that the mind is always chattering away with a thousand thoughts at once. Yeah, that's me, all right. <laughs> Clarity is the path to inner peace. Clarity is the path to inner peace. I, I I agree. Is anybody else sitting here a bit jealous of Homer? Just absolutely nothing going on there for a bit. Maybe he has the most inner peace out of all of us. Therapy is about clarity. It's not about having a professional, a therapist, come and solve our problems for us. If that's what's happening, you're not having therapy. That's really quite a dangerous thing. What you need is support to help understand your emotions, your thought patterns in response to that, and how it alters your perception of the world and how you act. With clarity, that makes you more readily able to understand and handle your own emotions, and with time, solve your own problems, hopefully without needing the therapist. But to do that, you need a safe space in therapy to be able to work past the host of often messy defense mechanisms that we impart in response to what are usually very messy emotions. Those defense mechanisms can provide resistance to really understanding the emotions that lie underneath. And with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, that's one of the goals that the psychedelics try to do is to overcome that resistance, allow those emotions to bubble to the surface, and then the psychotherapy part then helps you put those emotions into context and process them and understand them. That's the premise. But if it's not Marge, then who is it? Where do I begin looking? This really goes beyond my training as a furniture salesman. So <laughs> now, if you don't want the sofa, I'll have to ask you to leave. <laughs> hey, Bernie, soulmate! So stupid. The origin of Freud's psychotherapy couch, it lies in his desire to create this comfortable space that's private and free of distractions that facilitates something that he called free association and emotional openness. If patients were relaxed enough, you could freely associate your thoughts without the constraints of worrying about what the social norms are or different people's verbal or non-verbal response to that that were almost acting as cues as to whether those thoughts were permissible or not. So actually not being able to see and definitely not having eye contact with the therapist allowed that sort of social constraint to be removed. So there was a physical and a psychological distance that was thought to be key to the psychotherapeutic process. I read in the personal you were seeking a soulmate. Well, I also like rainy days in movies. Uh-huh. Uh... No, I don't like that. Or that. No, it's not that I'm afraid. I'm going to hang up now. Bye-bye. <laughs> I will let you uh, use your imagination as to what the other side of that conversation was. Oh, the world before Tinder and Grinder. <laughs> hey, look, is that Dad? Either that or Batman's really let himself go. <laughs> alone. I'm alone. Underneath all the funny bits of this episode, and it's brilliant, I love it. This is really touching on something though so intrinsically human. The search for connection, the search for purpose, people feeling lost. It really does parallel a lot of the motivations of why people go on things like an ayahuasca retreat. Seeking this sort of non-specific, spiritual, revelatory experience that you hope is going to give you this sense of clarity or psychic healing or shift your perspective in a way that you can't specify, you don't know how it's going to happen, but you you think and you hope it's going to be transformative and, and have all the answers, and at the end, we'll get clarity. Your face, Space Coyote! Space Coyote? Oh my God, the ship! <gasps> we'll all be killed! The light, we gotta get the light back on! <laughs> The success of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in the long term is still to be confirmed. Currently there are some very small scale trials. These are not generalizable to the wider population by any means, particularly for those with severe and enduring mental illness. But some of these early trials indicate that the psychedelics combined with psychotherapy might be at least no less effective than conventional treatments for anxiety and depression like an SSRI. However, these studies are very, very small, and I suspect the effect size seen is an overestimate. There is a statistical phenomenon called regression to the mean. So as the study sizes increase and the samples you're studying become more representative of the general population, then what we find is the effect size of change 
shrinks. So what we're seeing so far, we take with a pinch of salt. So I'm a little bit cynical because I don't think the hype currently is supported by the evidence. However, I'm desperate to be wrong with that because we really do need new avenues of treatment. And in science, we always start with the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that psychedelics either don't help or at least no better than our existing treatments. And it's up to the evidence to disprove that. That's how science works. So far to me, it hasn't, but I hope it does. Hey, who likes short charts? We like short charts. <laughs> So my takeaway from this is that I am still utterly terrified at the even thought or idea of being on something like Hot Ones. I do like watching it in this sort of voyeuristic way, I suppose. Look at us. <laughs> But if you like this episode, then you'll love my reaction to Homer being institutionalised in a psychiatric hospital. And predictably, it doesn't go well. Otherwise, let me know what you thought in the comments. I'll see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.